from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Apparition of English Actors Agosta congratulates. In June 1854, the Landport Hall at Portsmouth which was to be used for meetings, assemblies, and the like, was opened on the site of the old racket court next door to the White Swan public house. Not long after, one Henry Rutley arrived in Portsmouth, and after becoming licensee of the White Swan, leased the Landport Hall. Immediately he set about converting the hall into theater, and on Monday, September 29, 1856, the new Theater Royal opened its doors. The theater remained a flourishing enterprise right up to 1874, when Rutley died. After Rutley's death, the theater became celebrated for another reason, its haunting. In the evening news, Portsmouth, for Friday, October 4, 1957, the then general manager of the Theater Royal, Michael Wyde, reported that he was convinced that the theater was haunted. After sleeping for some months in a dressing room at the theater, Wyde became aware of two ghosts in the building. One, he believed, was the theater's founder, Henry Rutley. As I walk along the corridors to my office, I sometimes have a feeling of great friendship, as if Mr. Rutley were patting me on the back and saying, That's the stuff, old boy. The other ghost, he says, haunts the room next to his. The other night, I returned to the theater late and saw a light on in that room, Rutley's dressing room. As I walked in to switch it off, I had a most awful, creepy feeling. Others to have experienced and reported a feeling of ghostly presence. In 1956, 100 years to the day after the theater's opening, there was another strange occurrence. A chorus girl returning to the Rutland room on the third floor found that the door would not open. She went for assistance, but none could open the door and no key to fit the lock could be found. A fireman broke in but found that the door had been unlocked all the time. A Suicidal Sailor The oldest part of the Castle Theatre, Farnham, Surrey, the foyer in the section leading back toward Castle Street, date from the 13th century. The site was originally a granary for Farnham Castle, and today, it is said, Shafe is still to be found among the foundations. Much of the early history of the property suggests that it retained its farm role for many centuries, and latterly it became outbuildings, a builder's yard, a World War I delousing center, a roller skating rink, and finally a theater. These buildings were converted for use as a theater in 1939. It appears that a group of strolling players had come from France, where they had been touring, when the Germans caused the French to mobilize in May 1939. The company landed at Southampton and decided to work their way back to London, playing balls and barns along the way. On reaching Farnham, they played what is now the site of the Castle Theater, closed in 1974, and decided to set themselves up permanently in this building. Calling themselves the English Classical Players, they opened on December 5, 1939. The Farnham Repertory Company was formed in 1948. No one knows when the Castle Theater began to have a ghostly reputation and there is no one left who can actually claim to have seen the ghost. But several people have reported unaccountable footsteps. On one occasion, a spotlight was revolved by ghostly hands in the auditorium. Neither was a the theater very popular with dogs, which seems to have had an aversion for various parts of the buildings. One of the former house managers, Miss Helen M. S. Harvey, reported experiencing a strange atmosphere of coldness and a feeling that someone unseen was present that descends on the auditorium from time to time. The ghosts who worked the spotlights 
and tramp the boards is affectionately and respectfully known as George. In life, George appears to have been a sailor who lived in an apartment above the theater. On returning unexpectedly from a long sea voyage, he discovered his wife in bed with her lover. Mad with rage, he murdered the pair and afterward committed suicide by hanging himself from a rafter. The very beam can still be seen in the foyer. A multi-haunted theater. The Theater Royal Addington Street, Margate, Kent, is perhaps Southern England's most haunted theater. Opened in 1874, heir to 180 years of tradition, and holding slightly under 2,000 patrons, this theater has been associated with many famous actors. Its most famous manager was Miss Sarah Thorne, who guided its fortunes until 1894. Something of a martinet, Sarah Thorne made her theater celebrated in the south of England, but from around 1894 the playhouse began to decline. Over the years it suffered a number of vicissitudes and was turned into a furniture store. It was reopened as a theater in 1930, and subsequently it has been in turn a cinema, a theater, and a bingo hall. Fred Archer was probably the first to make a national story about the hauntings at the Theater Royal Margate. According to the local papers, a progressive series of hauntings began in 1918 when the ghost of Sarah Thorne was first seen. Miss Thorne, incidentally, is believed to have come back to protest at the modern usage of the theater, such as bingo and other gambling games. So frightening was her wrath to some witnesses that the police were called in to investigate, but they found nothing untoward. Archer says that the theater, where there is a trapdoor leading to what was a smuggler's cave, probably boasts the most diverse psychic happenings in the theatrical world, an orange-colored ball of light, a scream which starts backstage and seems to travel across the stage and finally exit through the stage door, and the appearance of a ghost in one of the boxes who draws back the curtain if they are closed. The latter phenomenon was witnessed by McQueen Pope, who believed the specter to be an actor who had committed suicide by throwing himself from the box into the orchestra pit sometime in the early 1900s. Joseph Braddock dates the suicide to late Georgian or early Victorian times. An actor from a company playing at the theater was dismissed for some reason, and on the next evening, he bought himself a box for the performance. During the course of the play, he committed suicide by throwing himself out of the box into the orchestra pit. Sometime during the first decade of our century, the wraith of a man was seen sitting in the box so often that the management was obliged to withdraw the box from sale, leaving it permanently curtained until finally it was bricked up. This, however, would predate the building of the Theatre Royal on the Addington Street site. Alternatively, the story, as Braddock heard it, could have referred to the 18th century site of Margate's theater tradition and was perhaps a transference of the myth. Modern testimony of the theater's hauntings comes from Alfred Charles Tanner, who was interviewed about his sightings in 1966 by Dr. A.R.G. Owen, the distinguished Cambridge parapsychologist, and Victor Sims. Tanner, it appears, was working during January of 1966 on the redecoration of the Theatre Royal when he encountered the ghostly happenings. In order that the redecoration should not interrupt the daytime bingo, Tanner had agreed to work through the night. His first night's work passed without incident, but during his second work stint, he heard a series of sounds coming from the stage, as if someone were whispering. He stopped work for a few moments to investigate, but could find no reason for the noises. Working on, he heard the natural creakings of the floorboards. Then, however, he heard the sounds of footsteps just in front of the stage and moving toward him. As he turned around to see who was there, the footsteps stopped. No one was to be seen. Suddenly, testifies Tanner, he heard the door of the box office bang violently. Again, no one was to be seen. The decorator was entirely alone in the old theater. Tanner resumed painting in the hope that the unusual noises he had heard were natural. Just as he was getting himself calm again, the phantom footsteps started once more. They came up behind him and halted when he turned, but this time there was something more eerie. 
Tanner heard an extremely heavy thump on the floor between the front rows of seats and the stage, as though a heavy object had fallen there. Charles Tanner looked across at the spot. I swear I saw the dust rising, just as it would be if a real object had hit the carpet. Of course, no object was visible. But could this have been the materialized impact of the ghostly suicide's cadaver hitting the floor? On the following night, Tanner was at work again when he was interrupted once more. This time he saw a semi-transparent globular object measuring about 10 inches across, moving across the stage from left to right. The globe laterally formed the shape of a head before it disappeared. This time Tanner saw curtains by the exit door being removed by an unseen hand. The next working night, Charles Tanner, who now had an assistant, Lawrence Rogers, was haunted again. Both heard a curious bang from the dress circle. This time the police were called, but no intruders were found. Certain aspects of these hauntings, the slow movement of the curtains and the bangs and footfalls, are typical of poltergeist, as set down by parapsychologist A. R. G. Owen and Raymond Bayless. But the face remains more of an unaccounted mystery. Following the theories of G. W. Lambert, some persons have said that the ghostly noises had something to do with seismic disturbances. But can earthquakes cause localization of phenomena in the theater at Margate? Can it localize noises to one position only within a building? Hardly. Certainly the ghosts of the Theater Royal Margate are best explained as poltergeist, with hallucination as a side effect in the case of the curtains and the face, almost as a form of mediumistic talent and terror. Above all, the atmosphere of this theater seems to be the most charged in Britain for psychic happenings. Lady in a Grey Dress It is not long after they take up their duties that the managers of the Theatre Royal Bath Somerset became aware of the resident ghost, a specter that consorts with a poltergeist from the pub next door. During the 1700s, the old Garrick's Head Hotel was a gambling den, then run by the famous dandy Richard Beau Nash. The hotel was connected with the Theatre Royal by a secret passage, which acted as a quick retreat for the impecunious raw bucks who would not pay their debts. The hotel ghost is a heavily built man in a dark colored wig, which matches his period costume. He disappears into the secret passage, leaving behind the aroma of toilet water. Just through the walls is the ghostly lady in gray, who still walks, it is said, the lower circle quarters of the theater, and sometimes occupies one of the stage boxes, or a box at the rear of the lower circle. She is an unknown woman, who committed suicide by throwing herself from the window of a room above the bar. This ghost has been seen many times by both artists and audience. Once when a grandfather clock mistakenly chimed in the middle of a scene, she was blamed. Certainly these two ghosts overlap each other's territory, but they seem to cohabit quite amicably. Tradition has it that the ghosts become more active when their respective premises are under new management, when the hotel gets a new landlord and the theater new manager. When the hotel changed landlords in the 1960s, the Bristol Evening Post interviewed the new tenant. The first day, here my keys vanished. Then they turned up in the middle of the lounge floor. It is a large bunch of keys and quite impossible for them to have been there all the time. I'm not a fanciful man, but every time I'll go down into the cellars, I can feel something, a sort of presence. It's spine-chilling. I don't mind having a ghost in the house, but the tricks he plays are annoying. He stole the mallet with which I drive the bungs into barrels, literally from behind my back. It weighs several hundred pounds, but just disappeared into thin air. It was several days before I found it again. The landlord's wife also added her testimony. I do not really believe in such things as ghosts, but such odd things happen in this place. There are noises on the stairs and noises in the attic no one can explain. Since we have been here, my baby has been waking every morning at 3 a.m. Something disturbs her. She does not cry but grumbles to herself for 20 minutes and then goes to sleep again. Both the landlord and his wife wished that their ghost would go and live with his lady friend at the theater, 
one teenage repertory actress, when staying at the Garrick's head, reported that during the evening of her first night at the hotel, someone knocked at her room door. She called, come in, and the door handle immediately began to turn, but there was no one there. It was very scary, she said later. I was with another girl, and we were both terrified. This actress and other guests were later awakened by a rumbling ghostly laugh around 3 a.m. in the morning. We were all sleeping in different rooms, and we all woke and went into the passage to listen. There was nothing imaginary about it. On a further occasion, the actress woke to find a room filled with a strange glow. When she put on the light, the glow vanished. A liking for violence. It was not until around World War I that the silent film shows began to oust the music halls from popularity. In the north of England, Randall Williams was one of the original pioneers, and his bioscope show caused a sensation when it made its first appearance at Hull Fair in October 1896. From this date, the bioscope began to take the place of the dioramas and the fairgrounds, and cinema circuits began to be developed. Remembering one cinema in County Durham, G. L. Mellor has said, The Askew Picture House in Gateshead was first licensed in 1913 by Cecil Horn, and a member of his family was licensed until the cinema closed down in 1955. It was always known locally as the Horn, and the silent days was twinned with Shipcoat and Durham Road. Reels of film were carried between these two cinemas by runners, whose wages were eight per night, plus four tram fare. The manager of the Askew at this time was Dennis Aidy, an engraver by trade, who painted the attractive color slides which were shown between the reels of film. One of these runners was the late Joseph Harrop, a spiritualist who, with a fellow spiritualist Charles Marshall, investigated the hauntings in the Askew Picture House during 1914 to 1915. Charles Marshall was rather doubtful that the manager, Dennis Aidy, would have given permission for an investigation, but after some hesitation on Aidy's part, the two men finally obtained it. Subsequently, Marshall and Harrop went to the cinema at 11 p.m. one October night in 1914 and were led in by the night watchman. After questioning the night watchman, who heard things here that are hard to believe. The two men chose seats in the middle of the auditorium and settled down to their eerie vigil. Later the two men reported a cold, dank, evil feeling as one o'clock approached. As the minutes went by they heard certain creakings and jarrings which they attributed to natural causes. Just after two o'clock they sensed presences all around them. The auditorium seemed to fill with invisible beings. Gradually, something began to form on the bare stage, just in front of the blank screen. Very slowly, that something on the stage took shape. Both men testified separately at their local spiritualist church that they saw the fantastically dressed figure of a girl. Her head was crowned with the weird head of some animal, which looked like a bat. On her shoulders were wings. A strange light surrounded her, as she fleetingly danced a grotesque avat on the stage. The girl's face remained hidden by a half-mask so that neither her rap nor Marshall could distinguish it. Her dance ended abruptly and the girl disappeared as if she had passed through the screen. Her place was taken by two spectral figures of men fighting some kind of duel. They too were enveloped in the ghostly light. Suddenly Marshall nudged her rap's arm, for in the seats nearest the stage he saw the startling white face of a clown watching the duelers. With the clown was another girl, dark-haired, in whose eyes was the glinting expression of the most deadly hatred that the two men had ever seen. In one hand the girl held what appeared to be a pistol, leveling at one of the ghostly duelers on stage. She fired. Marshall and Harap heard the shot and watched the phantom slowly vanish. Both men took some time to recover from the shock of what they had seen. Later they were able to compare notes with the night watchman, 
who had seen the enactment on two previous occasions, but not in such vivid detail. The intensity of the two spiritualist experience can probably be accounted for by their latent psychic potential for mediumship. Two or three days later, Harap and Marshall met Dennis Aidy and told him what they had seen. Until this time, Aidy had remained skeptical of the two men's vigil. Now, he was profoundly interested. Some 15 years ago, said Ed Aidy, there was an amateur theatrical group who put on plays in this very building. One play I heard tell was called Vengeance of the Bat. The principals were Harold Carter from Gosforth, Peter Ellis, Dolly Baker, and Vera Heppel from Gateshead, and Bill Darwin from Jesmond. Harold Carter and Peter Ellis, it appears, both fancied Dolly Baker, who took the part of the bat. One of Baker's understudies was Vera Heppel, who was supposed to be keen on Harold Carter. At one performance during the duel scene between Carter and Ellis, Carter was shot and killed. Bill Darwin, who played the clown, was known to bear a grudge against Carter, and he was arrested. In the court, he was proved to have threatened Carter, but he got off through lack of evidence. From your story, it looks as if Darwin was really innocent. But wait a minute. Aidy then produced a photograph of a girl and showed it to the two men. Both recognized it as the girl they had seen firing the pistol. Well, said Aidy, that's Vera Heppel. But why should she want to kill Harold Carter if she fancied him? asked Harap. Dunno, replied Aidy. Could be she was rejected by Carter and she killed him so he couldn't take up with Dolly Baker? Who knows? Anyway, I heard that Vera Hippel died around 1900 and Dolly Baker killed herself soon after. Both Darwin and Ellis were killed in the Boer War, so I don't suppose it matters much now. Strange to tell, the ghostly actors seemed to be present whenever there was dueling or pistol play in a film. At least it was when this type of film was showing that they made their best materializations. Situated at 317, 319 Askew Road West, the Askew Picture House had an interesting site history. The buildings were erected during 1880 to 1882 and the premises have been occupied by a butcher, a shop, and from 1894 to 1904, a Salvation Army barracks. Thus, 80's theater story comes from the Salvation Army days and could have been an entertainment put on by the Army. The building was demolished in 1968. Mrs. Siddons still walks. Mrs. Sarah Siddons was born at Brecon, Wales in 1755, the daughter of Roger Kemble, a provincial actor. In 1773, she married fellow actor Wildham Siddons, and two years later David Garrick engaged to play Portia at Drury Lane. The role was unsuccessful, however, and she went to the provinces, where she became a firm favorite among the provincial playgoers. After a successful return to London in 1782, she eventually retired in 1812. Sarah Siddons was remembered for her tragic roles such as Lady Macbeth. During her period out of favor in London, Mrs. Siddons played Britain's oldest playhouse, the Theatre Royal, Bristol, which had opened in 1766. Today, the Theatre Royal Bristol remains England's only surviving example of the larger town theatre of the 18th century. As the oldest theatre in the country, it has, with a few short breaks, been in continuous use for performances. It is recorded in the documents of the time the Sarah Siddons first played at Bath on Monday, March 15, 1779, in the Countess of Salisbury. That was the beginning of her discovery, for Bristol was to be the scene of some of her greatest triumphs. So well did she do that her ghost still walks the boards and surrounding rooms from time to time. Actress Chilly Boucher has a personal memory of the Bristol Theatre Phantom, which appeared to be an unhappy ghost. At the time this actress was appearing as Becky Sharp in an adaptation of Thackeray's Vanity Fair, the part required one quick change 
and for this Miss Boucher used a dressing room on the opposite side of the stage to her own. During one particular performance, she rushed off stage for a change to find the dressing room in darkness. She asked her dresser, a moody Irish girl, if she had switched off the light in the room, which should have been ready for the split-second change required. But the girl shook her head. The carefully arranged clothes had been disturbed, and the jewelry required by the scene had been disarranged. Discovering that one piece of jewelry was missing, Chili Boucher sent the dresser to look for it. When the girl had left the room, the light dimmed mysteriously, and the atmosphere became even colder and more gloomy. Then the actress heard, coming from the corner, the sound of someone sobbing and groaning. It stopped when the dresser came back. Questioned by Miss Boucher, the girl admitted hearing the voice moan and seeing the lights dim on previous occasions. The room was used no more after that. The whole theater, apart from the auditorium, was reconstructed in 1971, and since the opening in January of 1972, the specter of Sarah Siddons has been remarkably quiet. The assistant theater manager told me that the only recent interesting story is of the guard dog that refused to go into the room occupied by Shelley Boucher or into the old fly door and wardrobe area. Barbara Lee Hunt, who played Sarah Siddons and 60,000 Nights in 1966, reports that everything went wrong for her on the opening night, wigs falling off, miscues, fluffed lines, and so on. No such things happened to Anne Jameson, who played Sarah Siddons in Christmas back in King Street, Christmas 1972. At least she's not telling. Taste for Music In her book, Haunted England, Christina Hole, the folklorist, mentions the unknown ghost that haunts the Theatre Royal at York. The phenomenon surrounds unexplained organ music. During the 1930s, an actress and her sister, who were lodging near the theater in St. Leonard's Place, heard a few bars of very beautiful music around half past two in the morning. As far as they could tell, the music came from the theater, but the streets were totally deserted at the time, and the theater in total darkness. About an hour later, they heard the music again. Yet subsequent inquiry the following morning did not bring to light any satisfactory explanation. Christina Hull notes, I have not been able to learn what was played or to what period the music belonged. The theater is said to stand on the side of an old monastery, only the arch of which remains, but whether this had anything to do with the mysterious sounds is not known. The actress and her sister were quite definite in their statement that they were not dreaming, but were wide awake at the time and the fact that both of them heard it seems to bear this out. It is interesting to note that the organ was introduced to the Western Church in the 8th century, which would predate the monastery. Mystery at Bury St. Edmunds In psychic circles, Bury St. Edmunds is famous for its ghostly monks, near the remains of the prominent abbey, which once housed the shrine of St. Edmund, King of the East Angles, was martyred by the Danes. A little-known ghost, however, is that at the Theatre Royal Barry St. Edmunds. Most people think that the ghost here is that of William Wilkins, who built the theatre in 1819. He is the architect best remembered for his plans for the National Gallery in London. Wilkins had been concerned with the theatre in Barry since 1808, when he took the lease of the little theatre above the Market Cross. His projects flourished for a time, but by 1830 he was in financial difficulties and the theater closed in 1843. The theater was first called Theater Royal when William James Achilles Abington reopened its doors in 1845. Some say that sorrow at its ultimate failure or jealousy of Abington makes the wraith of Wilkins walk. Rush of Cold Air at Derby Chili Boucher, who recorded a psychic experience at Bristol Theater, also came across the strange happening at Derby's Grand Theatre. She told Fred Archer, a prominent writer of ghostly phenomena, that every time she passed the stage to get to her dressing room, on entering the theatre she felt a sudden rush of cold air. Her dresser too had experienced this and told the actress that her dog cowered in fear if he was taken anywhere near the spot. 
it seems that the stage of the Grand Theatre Derby was the scene of at least one tragedy. Two variety artists were working on a trapeze act when during one performance an iron clamp holding their apparatus to the stage broke loose and swung out, hitting one of the performers on the head. The girl died instantly on the stage. People remember that the cold rush of air was never experienced before this. Mary Blandy's Ghost The Kenton Theatre, Henley on Thames, was built in New Street in 1805 by Samson Penley and John Jonas. It was opened on November 7, 1805 and remains the fourth oldest theater in England. According to local tradition, the theater became uninhabited in recent times by a ghost that predates the playhouse by nearly a century. Mary Blandy was a local girl who was hanged at Oxford in 1752. It appears that she had poisoned her father for objecting to her marriage plans. From time to time, it is recorded, her ghost was seen in the garden of the house where she lived. Most sightings say that she is seen under a mulberry tree and is accompanied by the ghostly figure of her sweetheart of whom her father had disapproved. The Joan Morgan play, The Hanging Tree, based on Mary Blandy's crime, was staged at Kenton Theatre in 1969. During the performance, a ghostly female was seen at the back of the stalls. It is interesting to note that a similar ghostly form was seen at Henley Town Hall a few years earlier when the Mary Blandy trial was being dramatized. Phantom at the Lyric Theater When the game of bingo took over at the Lyric Theater at Wellingboro, North Hampshire, the resident ghost didn't seem to mind. This phantom had seen many changes, that is, if one can track down which phantom it is. There are two theories. The first claims that the ghost is a disturbed spirit from an old graveyard. According to a book called Then and Now, published in the early 1920s by the Reverend Andrew, there was a chapel and burial ground on the site of the theater. The Cheese Lane Congregational Chapel, as it was called, was closed down in 1903. Its graveyard was emptied and the monument still preserved removed. It appears that the disinterred bodies were removed to London Road Cemetery in Wellingboro. Maybe, some say, the ghost is just one of the souls whose body was missed and is still buried under the Lyric Theater. After the chapel came a leather factory. The Lyric was not built until 1936. The second ghost theory is based on the tale that many years ago a district manager at the theater hanged himself. After the company controlling the place decided to dismantle some light fixtures of which he was extremely fond. This ghost, be it the unhappy manager or not, doesn't confine his spectral steps to the theater. He haunts the site of the former dance hall next door, not forgetting the premises of a nearby co-op. Sightings of the ghost are well authenticated. Mrs. Barbara Mansfield, acting manager and theater secretary, told the Evening Telegraph on October 3, 1969. I have seen the ghost, and I'm not spooky. I was downstairs locking up the stockroom not long ago when I felt something behind me, and when I looked up there was something going across the balcony in the foyer. It looked like a white face. I called out, who's there? And it disappeared. I was convinced it was a trick, until I saw it again not long after. Maintenance engineer and bingo caller Mick Lamb nearly resigned after he came face to face with a ghost one night while working alone backstage. In the same issue of the telegraph he reported. I went to switch the lights on. Then I went up to one of the perches and along the back of the stage to do some repairs. All of a sudden I saw it on a perch in the right hand flyer. I thought it was one of the patrons just hanging there. It scared me and I ran down the stairs, through the theater and out into the street. I threatened to leave the theater. I've seen it since then. It was in a brown jacket and possibly white trousers. A human form, but hazy. The ghost was seen to by Mrs. Sheila Lefebvre, a theater snack bar girl, several times when she worked in an upstairs kitchen, but now the kitchen has been transferred downstairs. Mrs. Violet West 
former bank clerk with six other held a vigil and saw the ghost. It looked like a white shadow or a statue that had been unveiled and it moved like a jet from one side of the foyer balcony to another and then disappeared. An article in the Evening Telegraph for November 4, 1969 noted, Now the scoffing has got to stop. A ghost really does haunt Wellingboro's Lyric Theater. There followed a report of how members of the West Hertfordshire Psychic Research Group and others arranged a further all-night vigil. Television cameras, spook temperature devices, and recorders were all set up. Apparently, the first to see the ghost in the balcony was Mrs. Elamay Flutter. I can't really say what happened. Something just made me look up and this image was there. It was gone just as quickly as it came. In seance manner, the purported spirit was asked questions by one of the party. A series of clicks, one for yes and two for no, was heard in answer to such queries as, Are you the spirit of someone who was alive on earth and is now dead? Positive click. Again, the questioner went through the alphabet, suggesting that the spirit of the Lyric Theater click at the letters it wanted to use. The spirit is reported to have clicked at the letters H-E-L-P. Another witness saw two red lights near us that moved slowly along the balcony and then became one. After a rest, the spirit was asked to select more letters by the click method. The following message was received. Daniel, help. A further message, which was the last, was spelled out. This not published. Nine days later, the Evening Telegraph reported that members of the local clergy had been asked to help lay the spirit to rest. Subsequent messages spelled out staccato sentences for bless the bones and bring back priest. In a follow-up article in Weekly's December 12th, under the title of Soldier Returns Home as Ghost, these comments were made. The ghost of Wellingboro's Lyric Theater has appeared before many years ago and is well known to old inhabitants of the town. This is a theory put forward by a brother and sister who lived in Wellingboro during their youth. They saw it on several occasions as it walked in Cheese Lane, now Commercial Lane, at the back of the Lyric Theater. Mrs. Ann Lockwood of 64 Cedar Way, Wellingboro, is surprised that no one in Wellingboro has come forward before now, since so many people knew about it. Her brother, Mr. Ron Smith of 48 Northumberland Avenue, Kettering, suggests that it might be fear on the part of the local inhabitants. He explained that as children they would hide in a doorway in Cheese Lane and wait for the ghost to appear. They did this in spite of warnings never to go down there. We saw a soldier dressed in the uniform of the 1914-1918 war. The street was made of huge cobblestones but there was absolutely no noise coming from his feet as he walked, said Mr. Smith. As we saw the figure walk into the entry between two cottages, we ran as fast as we could with the intention of following him. When we got there, he had completely disappeared, he said. They tried on several occasions, and each time he had disappeared by the time they reached the entry. Mr. Smith, who is now 49, was six years old when they first began to watch the ghost. The somber street lit only by a lamp bracket on the wall, the cobbled street, the lime-washed stone, and the haze-like figure of the ghost have all formed a heavy imprint on his memory. The back of the Lyric Theater corresponds to where the old cottages were, where they used to watch the figure of the soldier. There is therefore more than a probability that the ghost which recently made its presence known to an experimental group in the theater is the same one. The story became even more intriguing when Mr. Smith mentioned the legend which is attached to the ghost. Mrs. Lockwood's sister elucidated on the legend. Two brothers lived in one of the cottages with their mother and father. One of the brothers went off to war but was killed before revisiting his home. Before his death he vowed that he would return from the war. In the early hours of November 4 this year the spirit slowly spelled out a message to the research group in the Lyric Theater. The words were, Daniel, help. 
Mrs. Lockwood recalled the brothers' names were Daniel and George. And so the story begins to take shape. George went off to war vowing that he would return to his birthplace. But he was killed in action and returns to Wellingboro in spirit only. He now seems to be seeking help from his brother Daniel. Mrs. Lockwood knows the family, who have since moved from the area, and she has lost track of them. She said she would not like to commit herself on the surname. When a large sum of money was missing from the Lyric Theater, the owners put a ban on all after-hour psychic investigations. John Henry Broadrib, better known as Sir Henry Irving, made his official acting debut in London at St. James Haunted Theater on October 6, 1866. Nearly 40 years later, his wraith became part of another theater's history. During April 1905, Sir Henry revived the Tennyson play Beckett at Drury Lane, where it was enthusiastically received. This decided him to take the play on tour to the provinces. After performance in the title role at the Theatre Royal, Manningham Lane, Bradford, Yorkshire, he collapsed and died in the foyer of the Midland Hotel. Thereafter, his ghost was reported as being seen by cleaners and stagehands at the old theatre. Another Bradford theatre is deemed haunted, the Alhambra Theatre at the bottom of Manchester Road. This theatre has seen many famous performances, including some made by actors and actresses making their stage debut. One such was David Hamilton, the present-day British television personality and disc jockey. The strange occurrence happened about 7 p.m., just before Hamilton was about to go on stage. He was quite alone in his dressing room and was sitting in front of the mirror putting on his makeup. He recalls that as he sat there, he suddenly felt odd and shivered slightly. Looking into the mirror, he saw, reflected, the face of a man smiling at him. He whirled around in his seat, but the room was empty. It was a nice smile, said Hamilton. I could see that clearly. I knew he had not come to harm me. After the initial shock, I was not afraid. Somehow, after seeing that face, the nervous tension in the pit of his stomach disappeared, leaving him with the butterflies which all actors must have to give a good performance. The mystery was to deepen a few days later. As David was leaving the theater after performance, he was stopped at the stage door by a large group of autograph hunters. He was signing one particular girl's book, when she proudly told him that her grandfather had been an actor at the Alhambra and showed Hamilton a faded sepia print. The face looked familiar, so David Hamilton stepped back into the doorway to examine the picture under the light. It was the face that had smiled at him in the dressing room mirror. Stunned, Hamilton had the photograph back to the girl. In a moment, she had hurried away with her autograph book before he had a chance to learn her grandfather's identity. Today, David Hamilton is sorry that he had not the presence of mind to find out who the actor had been, thus putting a name to the ghost at the Alhambra Theatre. Aggie of Watford Watford's Palace Theatre in Hertfordshire, built in 1908 as a music hall, remains as a souvenir of Edwardian theatricals, and is the home of the curious ghost known as Aggie, a friendly specter who seems to date from the time when Marie Lloyd famed music hall comedian Grace the Boards there. Most folks think that in this case the ghost is that of a former stagehand, for the spirit gets noisy if there is a lot of clutter around. One assistant house manager and several of the stagehands have often felt Aggie's presence, some to have heard mysterious footsteps on stage and in a particular dressing room over the scenery dock. Another incident was cited where curtains covering a door fluttered mysteriously to one side as though someone was walking through them. This was around 3 a.m. when a set was being hurriedly erected. The team of workers watched the route of the footsteps in the gallery and were startled to see the curtains of the facing door moving as an unseen ghost passed through. <laughs> 